All right, everyone, welcome back to another installment of Night Skies of Fort Collins. Uh, once again, my name is Ben Gondres, and I am the Dome Theater Manager at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery. And I just want to thank you all for tuning in tonight to learn a little bit about the night sky and what you can find in the night skies above Fort Collins. Now, with that said, we are broadcasting to Facebook and YouTube. So if you're watching from somewhere other than Fort Collins, that is totally fine. Everything that I show you tonight uh, should be visible in your own night skies as well, as long as you're in the northern hemisphere of the Earth, and uh, with some slight variations based on exactly where you are located uh, to take into account for different timing of things. Um, but yeah, we're going to be using a virtual planetarium software called Stellarium, and Stellarium is actually a really cool free open source program that you can get yourself. And uh, I'll go ahead and post the uh, link to Stellarium in the comments here if you're interested in it. Um, it's really fun to use and to be able to view the night sky um, from any time and any place on Earth. And this is really helpful if you're planning a stargazing trip yourself. Uh, and if you want to know where and when to actually look for the thing that you want to find, um, it's very useful to be able to pull up Stellarium go to a specific date and time and uh, see exactly where that thing is positioned. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be using Stellarium for this program. And before I get started, I also wanted to mention that the Museum of Discovery is reopened. Um, you can come and visit us. And uh, I do suggest that you head to our website, however, uh, fcmod.org slash reopening so that you can uh, get stay informed about all of the changes that we've made uh, to keep everyone healthy and safe in this time in visiting the museum. Uh, but we do encourage you to come uh, visit us. We've got all of our exhibits open. Um, the Dome Theater itself is not open just yet, but ho we're hoping to do that soon as well. Um, so yeah, come stop by and visit us and make sure to visit the website before you do. All right, well, I think with that said, let's go ahead and jump into Stellarium and get started with our program tonight. So we've now entered the tail end of the Delta Aquarid meteor shower. And if you tuned in last week, you may remember me talking about this meteor shower that peaked last Wednesday, actually. But they, uh, you might still see some meteors throughout the night. If you lay out under the night sky for a while, um, you may see some meteors flying across the night sky still especially between the moonset and sunrise in the early morning hours. Another nighttime sight that is winding down is the comet C2020F3 Neowise. We've talked about this comet for the past few weeks 
Um, and the comet is now about 50 degrees high at sunset, although you'll need to wait for the sky to darken before you can find it at all. Uh, it's currently in the west-southwest, west, sailing through the constellation of Como Berenices, uh, which I believe is located right here. Como Berenices is, of course, Berenices' hair. And the comet can be located right by this star here, Diadem. And if we zoom into that area, we should, actually let's center that up, we should see the comet Neowise right in that area. And actually there it is right here, Comet C2020 Neowise, 2020 F3 Neowise, excuse me. And uh, observers report that the comet is now magnitude four. And if you recall the magnitude scale, the lower the number, the brighter the object is with the magnitude one being the brightest stars in the night sky. So magnitude four means it's going to be very barely visible to the naked eye under good conditions away from light pollution. So if you're gonna go out and try to find it, I highly suggest at least taking binoculars with you, if not a small telescope. And uh, speaking of which, Neowise's fuzzy coma and tail both require binoculars or a small scope to really pick out. All right, let's go ahead and zoom back out. And uh, another interesting fact is that the exact midpoint of summer came today at 1108 Mountain Daylight Time. And this is the halfway point between this year's June solstice and the September equinox. So here we go, we're marching on towards fall. So let's go ahead and turn a little bit and face the Northwest. And in the Northwest, you're gonna see a well-known collection of stars known as the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper is actually an asterism known uh, that's part of the constellation of Ursa Major or the Big Bear. You can find the Big Dipper right up here in the Northwest uh, with these seven stars, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And as I said, the Big Dipper is actually part of Ursa Major, which is this full constellation. Ursa Major is the Big Bear. Now, if you find the two stars in the end of the Dipper part of the Big Dipper here, the ladle, uh, these two stars are Merak and Dubai. These two stars are known as the pointer stars and they always point towards Polaris, the North Star. And Polaris always stays in the same spot night after night throughout the year. And that's because it is in space almost directly above our North Pole or the axis of the, the, that the Earth rotates on. So if you follow these two stars by about three fists at arm's length, you will find Polaris. Polaris lies at the tail of the Little Dipper or Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. And Polaris is one of the brighter stars in the Little Dipper. It can often be kind of difficult to find the Little Dipper actually, because a lot of these stars are very dim. The other bright stars are at the end of its bowl and they are second magnitude Co Kochab and third magnitude, Fearcad. On August evenings, you'll find them to Polaris's upper left by about a fist and a half. They're called the guardians of the pole as they ceaselessly circle around Polaris throughout the night and through the year. Now, if we look high in the night sky, so we're looking almost directly overhead, you can see there's the Eastern horizon and looking almost directly overhead in the summertime here, about an hour after sunset, the familiar summer triangle, which is formed by the stars Altair in the constellation of Aquila, the eagle, Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus, the swan, and Vega in the constellation of Lyra, the harp. Here's the artwork for those three constellations. But these three bright stars make up the asterism that is known as the Summer Triangle. And the Summer Triangle is really uh, a great asterism to know about and to find because it frames the Milky Way galaxy for us. You can see the Milky Way, this cloudy band 
of uh, dust going through here is actually the band of our Milky Way galaxy, our home galaxy where we live. And these three stars, the Summer Triangle, hold some nice surprises for us in the dark skies. So if you go out tonight before the moon rises, because the moon uh, creates a lot of light and washes out the night sky, so this is uh, something you'll, you're going to want to do before the moon rises, you'll find a couple of really amazing deep sky objects if you have binoculars or a small telescope. And one of those is known as the Ring Nebula, or M57, located right here in the constellation of Lyra. Let's go ahead and zoom into the Ring Nebula so that we can see it in better detail here. And the Ring Nebula, or M57, is a planetary nebula formed as a sun-like star puffs away its outer layers at the end of its life. You can find M57 about six and a half degrees southeast of Vega. Through a small telescope, the ring appears as a pale gray sphere, so not quite this colorful image that you're seeing here. This image is actually from the Hubble Space Telescope and is a composite of, of images in different wavelengths, which is what gives, its, gives it its beautiful, colorful appearance. However, if you have a telescope, you can crank up the magnification to bring out more detail, which will reveal the outer edges of the sphere look thicker and darker than its center. Again, that's about six and a half degrees away from the bright star Vega. And nearby is another deep sky object, M56. And M56 is a magnitude 8.4 globular cluster. Let's go ahead and zoom into that. Here you can see this dense cluster of stars. And you should be able to view this object for, uh, with binoculars from a dark site away from light pollution while a telescope should show you it even with some light pollution. As the night wears on and moonrise approaches, skip over to Cygnus to view its beautiful bicolored double star Alberio, which is right here in the head of Cygnus the Swan. And Deneb forms the tail of Cygnus's, uh, Cygnus the Swan. In this double star, the magnitude 3.4 primary appears golden yellow. And in this detailed image, you can see it much, much better. While its fainter magnitude 5.2 companion appears blue. The stars are easy to split or see separate from each other under low magnification. The two stars of Alberio constitute a true binary star system. In other words, it's two stars that are not merely a chance alignment as seen from Earth. Instead, they actually revolve around a common center of mass. These two stars lie quite far apart, however, and might take as long as 100,000 years to orbit one another. Even though these two stars appear close together in a telescope, keep in mind that you are looking at a system that is 430 light years away from us. By the way, the brighter of the two stars in the Alberio system has been found with advanced telescopic techniques to actually be two stars as well. Thus, there are at least three stars in this system. So I hope you can find the Summer Triangle about an hour after sunset and see some of these amazing objects located within it. Now, if we look down towards the east, and move time forward to about 9.45. You can actually see it rising there. We have a bright object rising in the east-southeast. Let's move time a little faster. All right, here we go, at about 10.30. And this object is, of course, the moon. And the moon is currently located in the constellation of Aquarius, the water bearer. The moon was full this past Monday night. It was the Sturgeon full moon. However, tonight the moon is still 98% illuminated. So let's go ahead and zoom into the moon to see what that looks like. 
Here you can see the illuminated side of the moon is on the left, which means that the moon is waning or going towards a dark new moon. And this is a waning gibbous phase. You can see just about 2% of the moon is in darkness right now. So this is a really great time to get out and look at the moon. I encourage you to look at the moon and try to find some of its features, including one very prominent crater known as Tycho, and located in the southern highlands of the moon, right around this location. And here is a better picture of Tycho itself. This crater measures 53 miles across. And scientists think this crater formed from an impact about 108 million years ago. Over time, the bright rays of the crater will fade with prolonged exposure to space, which includes bombardment by micrometeorites and particles in the solar wind. All right. And looking to the south, we will find a couple of very bright planets that we've talked about before, but all this summer there is no missing the bright planets Jupiter and Saturn on any starry evening. Jupiter is the brightest point in the night sky right now, located right here, almost directly to the south at about 1040, it looks like. And right next to it, to the left, is Saturn. Let's go ahead and zoom in on Jupiter. Here we can see Jupiter and its cloudy bands. Jupiter, of course, is a gas giant planet, which means it has no solid surface to stand on. If we zoom out some, you can see some of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Here we have Io and Europa and Ganymede and Callisto way out here, all lined up nicely. Depending on when you look at Jupiter, you may see moons even passing in front of Jupiter, ca casting a shadow on its cloudy surface. And once again, right next to it is Saturn. Let's go ahead and zoom in on Saturn. There's Saturn, the beautiful ringed planet, along with a few of its moons. I think at last count, Saturn had 70, I, I want to say it was 78 moons in total. So it's got quite a few companions out there orbiting it. And you can see the rings of Saturn, especially if you've got a telescope uh, with you, a large telescope with you, you can see the rings of Saturn in pretty nice detail. And just to the right of Jupiter and Saturn is the constellation of Sagittarius, the Archer. And part of the constellation of Sagittarius is also known as the Teapot. And as we move through summer, you'll notice the Teapot dipping and, tipping and pouring out uh, here over the southern horizon. And in fact, if you stay out throughout the night or look at it throughout the night, you will notice that happening as well. Moving back to the east and moving time forward, we'll see another planet rising over the eastern horizon. And here is bright orange Mars. Mars will rise in the east at around 11 p.m. And Mars is currently located in the constellation of Pisces, the fish. Speeding up time once again, we will see another bright planet rising in the northeast here, the east-northeast. And this planet is, of course, Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun and is often one of the brightest objects in the night sky. However, I think Jupiter still has it beat right now. As dawn gets underway, Venus bla blazes brightly in the east, and to its right or lower right is the constellation of Orion, the hunter.
and moving time almost to sunrise here we'll see yet another planet rising in the glare of the sun and this is mercury let's go ahead and move time forward a little farther all right and as you can see mercury is in the glare of the sun and it's growing as brightness however it's also getting a little lower up to the horizon each morning you can find it about 30 degrees uh, lower left of brilliant venus all right well that's my tour of the night sky and now i wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update on the mars 2020 mission containing the perseverance rover and the ingenuity helicopter which, as you probably know, has had a successful launch last Thursday from Cape Canaveral in Florida. And it's now on its long journey to Mars. The mission is now in its cruise phase. And the cruise phase begins after the spacecraft separates from the rocket soon after the launch. The spacecraft departs Earth at a speed of about 24,600 miles per hour. The trip to Mars will take seven months and about 300 million miles. During that journey, engineers have several opportunities to adjust the spacecraft's flight path to make sure its speed and direction are best for arrival at Jezero Crater on Mars. The first tweak to the spacecraft's flight path will be about 15 days after launch, currently scheduled for August 14th which will point the spacecraft toward Mars and fine tune its flight path after launch. Perseverance is scheduled to land on Mars on February 18th, 2021. The Mars Perseverance rover will search for signs of ancient microbial life, which will advance NASA's quest to explore the past habitability of Mars. The rover has a drill to collect core samples of Martian rock and soil then store them in sealed tubes for pickup by a future mission that would ferry them back to Earth for detailed analysis. Perseverance will also test technologies to help pave the way for future human exploration of Mars. And strapped to the rover's belly for the journey to Mars is a technology demonstration Mars helicopter, which is named Ingenuity, and you can see it in this image here which may, if it works, achieve a Wright Brothers moment by testing the first powered flight on the Red Planet. Now I'm gonna switch applications here and share a different application with you. And this, uh, this program is actually called Eyes on the Solar System. And it's another free application uh, offered by NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology. Um, and this has really uh, been a fun program for me to play around with. Uh, you can view an interactive model of our solar system, as well as a lot of different missions that NASA has out in space. And you can see exactly where they are at this current time. Um, so yeah, I thought we would look at the Mars 2020 mission, which is located right here. You can see Earth's orbit right here and Mars 2020 right next to it. So it hasn't gone very far just yet. So let's go ahead and zoom into the Mars 2020 mission. So here we can see the spacecraft in its cruise configuration with solar panels on top of it. And you can see the heat shield on the bottom for when it enters the atmosphere of Mars. Now Earth is moving through the solar system at a pretty fast speed of 67,000 miles per hour as it orbits the sun. Let's go ahead and zoom out here. Uh, which creates our 365-day orbit around the sun. But Mars is farther from the sun, so it's actually slower and takes longer. Uh, in orbits, when something is closer to the thing it's orbiting, it's moving faster. So Earth is moving um, at 67,000 miles per hour, and a year on Mars actually takes 687 Earth days. Also, the planets aren't moving in perfect circular paths around the sun. Instead, they have elliptical or more oval-shaped orbits. And Mars's orbit is tugged on by, mass, by the massive gas giant Jupiter, which can change its orbit shape. 
Mars and Earth are also slightly tilted in their orbits. But every 26 months, Mars and Earth end up in a nice alignment on the same side of the sun and are closer together than usual. And that is currently what is happening. And that's why you've seen uh, th this Perseverance mission is actually the third mission to launch this summer to Mars. The other two, one from Russia, uh, excuse me, China, and the other from the United Arab Emirates. So we can actually follow along here if we want to. We can speed up time and follow along with the Perseverance Mars 2020 mission on its approach to Mars. Now we can't shoot uh, a spacecraft directly towards Mars. What we have to do is actually make Mars 2020 a satellite of the sun. So technically Mars 2020 is actually orbiting the sun itself as we slowly raise its orbit to match that of Mars. And as I said before, objects at a lower orbit orbit faster than objects at a higher orbit. And so we're able to use less fuel by doing it this way. You'll see that as we approach February of next year, we seem to almost overtake Mars a little bit. And that's so that we can actually meet up with Mars in its orbit once we get into the same orbit. And once there, we will of course go into orbit around Mars before making our landing on the surface of Mars. And interestingly, this uh, landing will be using the same exact technique that we used to land the Mars Curiosity rover. All right, so here we are at about February 18th and just about at Mars. So I look forward to landing, uh, the landing of Perseverance on Mars, and I hope you do too. And uh, yeah, it should be really fun to see. Awesome. Well, I think that's my show for tonight. So thank you again for joining me. If you do have any questions for me, uh, please feel free to leave those in the comments below. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, I do encourage you to uh, visit our website and consider making a donation to the museum so that we can continue to bring these types of programs to you. And uh, as the, um, yeah. <laughs> I will stick around for just a moment here. If anyone does have any questions, once again, please feel free to leave those in the comments below. And uh, if you're watching this later on, on our Facebook page or YouTube page, because these videos do stay up on our pages, so you can always view them at a later date. Um, if you are watching at a later date and you do have a question, feel free to leave it in the comments as well. And I will comment back with an answer to your question there. All right. There's a little bit of a delay in uh, the broadcast here, so I will just wait a few more seconds to see if anyone has any questions. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any questions come in just yet, so that's fine. Um, yeah, I guess uh, we'll call it for tonight. And I hope you guys get out and are able to see some of the things that I pointed out to you tonight in the show, some constellations, some deep sky objects, and perhaps even a meteor or two. I hope you guys all have a great week and we will see you again here next week for Night Skies of Fort Collins. We also have other programs that we do uh, on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, including Storytime on Friday mornings, a uh, Discovery Live, Ask a Scientist, uh, or Ask, Ask an Expert actually is the, the one we're gonna do next Thursday night. Um, so I do encourage you if you haven't already to follow and like um, the Facebook or the, the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery and the Otterbox Dome Theater Facebook pages uh, to know when those things are happening. Awesome. Well, thank you guys all once again for joining me here. And I hope you have a great night and keep looking up.